Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and elders from other communities who may be here today. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Joe Trapani, and I'd first like to thank him for uh, getting across the road without getting lost. According to Wikipedia, he was born on July the 1st, 1988, and he's an American-Italian basketball player. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but this Joe Trapani, I've known since I was an intern in uh, 1985 at the Royal Melbourne Hospital, and uh, Joe uh, also trained there, did his medical degree in 77, PhD in 86, completed physician training in rheumatology, and then went to do a postdoc in the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York. And uh, he's now, of course, uh, Director of Research at the Peter Mac uh, Cancer Centre and lodged across the road at the VCCC. He's interested in the immunopathology of viral diseases, apoptosis, induction by cytotoxic lymphocytes and cancer immunotherapy. Take it away, Joe. Well, thanks very much, Dave. It's a real pleasure to be here, particularly as we're, we're now neighbours officially. And uh, I must say the, uh, um, the move has been very, very busy. Um, there's been a huge amount of work. And um, in fact, uh, I found the first meeting notes about the move and they were more than 10 and a half years ago when, when the whole project started. So it's been quite a labour to get here. But let me say sincerely, because um, I know uh, I've got lots of personal friends and professional colleagues in the audience, that one of the real highlights for me with respect to coming over here is that uh, hopefully we're able to collaborate with many of the people here at WeHi uh, more closely, so I mean that sincerely. Um, and, uh, and, and for that reason today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to touch on a number of areas, and you'll see there's some recent data. Uh, there's quite a few uh, projects that we're doing that are incomplete, and I thought if I sort of give a bit of a teaser on some of those, you'll get a bit of an idea on, on what we're doing, and perhaps we can start uh, to work um, together on some of these. So as Davo said, um, I've been working uh, for many years um, on cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. And of course, these cells are incredibly important. They protect us against virus infected cells and, and cells that are undergoing malignant transformation. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the mechanism of cell death, how do CTL and NK cells kill their targets. Uh, just touch briefly on uh, what happens when this process fails. So why is it that a, a very common sequel, in fact, is very severe systemic inflammation, an inflammation that's actually s severe enough to kill the host. Uh, and then I don't talk about granzymes that much anymore, because actually we do a lot of work on granzymes. I thought I'd just talk a little bit about granzyme-mediated cell death and apoptosis and some of the things uh, we're doing currently in that field. OK. So, so really, although I'm going to perhaps uh, move around a little bit, there are actually some very, very important common themes to these. And really, um, basically, like the rest of the immune system, cell death pathways aren't static. I mean, that's really a key thing. And, and the mechanisms of target cell death are dynamic. And, and like pretty much everything else in the immune response, it's shaped by the never-ending duel with pathogens and, of course, the converse, which is autoimmune consideration. So some of the things I'll touch on today. So features of cell death pathway admitted by the immune system, mediated by the immune system are things like the rapidity of the cell death. So cell death here takes a minute or two, or perhaps an hour or so. But if you've got a virus in a cell, normally you want to get rid of it pretty quickly, unless it's a chronic virus and there's a sort of a, a symbiosis, if you like. Um, the pathways are diverse. There's a multiplicity of death pathways. And as I hope I to get to towards the end of the talk, they're arranged in a hierarchical fashion. There are differences between species, uh, and that's probably driven by species-specific pathogens, perhaps not surprisingly. But then also, there are polymorphisms across members of a species, and, and even some evidence, uh, uh, I'll show you something a bit speculative, but uh, perhaps even geographic differences uh, in, in a mouse pathogen that I'll tell you about. So that just gives you a bit of a flavor of what I'm going to talk about. So back to, back to basics of the granule exocytosis pathway, a very old slide, uh, but it, it shows uh, basically that death through this pathway requires a synergy between two really quite distinct types of, um, of toxins that are packaged together in these presynaptic vesicles in the killer cell, and then uh, the contents of those are, are liberated into the synaptic cleft when two cells form uh, a stable conjugate. 
So just to introduce the main players, the first one, um, which is absolutely essential, is a pore-forming protein called perforin. Um, the second family is actually represented by granzyme B, but it's, uh, it's actually they're a family of granzymes or granule serine proteases. So they're, they're, they're proteases and they're of the serine protease family. Now, perforin is a calcium-dependent protein. Once it, is, it leaves the, the killer cell, binds calcium, and then it, through that step, it acquires avidity for, um, for the cell membrane and perforin monomers actually become attracted to one another as well, as I'll show you in a moment. And they form transmembrane pores that are responsible for then allowing access into the cytosol to the granzymes, and particularly granzyme B. Now, I'm going to talk quite a bit about granzyme B. Granzyme B is potently pro-apoptotic, and that's because it shares with the caspases uh, the unique capacity to cleave um, to a uh, process certain uh, distinct uh, targets after aspartate, uh, after aspartate residues. Okay. Now, human granzyme B, uh, here's, uh, here's an example of species differences. I'll show you a bit more about this later, but human granzyme B is particularly good at cleaving BID and activates the mitochondrial uh, pathway and so is BCL2 inhibitable. Uh, uh, the mouse uh, form of granzyme B actually doesn't do this very efficiently at all. Uh, and it tends to activate caspases directly. So that's, that's an immediate uh, difference. Now, um, we favour passive diffusion of granzymes into the cell through these pores, but there's actually a second uh, hypothesis which has perforin and granzymes co being co-internalised into uh, endosomes, or, or things called gigantosomes, actually, and then perforin only becoming activated uh, after this endocytic step takes place. But in, in the end, um, the, the end result of perforin's action is to deliver granzyme B into the cytosol and other granzymes. Now, one of the reasons we favour passive diffusion is related to the actual structure of perforin, both the monomer but particularly the, the, the pore form. And uh, a few years ago, we were fortunate enough to be collaborating with James Wistock. We published, co-published the uh, first um, X-ray crystal structure of, of a perforin monomer, this, is, uh, this being the mouse. And so here's a ribbon diagram of the molecule. You can see it's sort of key-shaped. It's pointy down this end, and, and it has two principal domains. There's a, there's a membrane proximal, C2 domain, which is important for calcium-dependent membrane binding. And then up here, a membrane distal, uh, so-called MAC-PF domain, MAC standing for membrane attack complex of complement, because they also share this domain, and, per, and, and, and perforin, and that's important for membrane insertion. Now, if you turn the molecule side on, it's really quite a remarkable molecule. It's very, very thin. It's wedge-shaped. And that's because up to 24 of these molecules have to coalesce to form a pore. Now, over the years, and I'm not going to talk about this uh, hardly at all today, but we've worked out what a number of these uh, critical domains and residues of perforin do. So just to highlight a couple of things, we know how oligomers are formed, and that depends on a, exquisitely on a single salt bridge between a, a conserved positively charged arginine in the front of one monomer making contact with a negatively charged glutamate uh, on, on the back of the next one. Uh, and then right down at the very C terminus here, at the very terminal tryptophan at position 555 and in neighbouring residues, uh, it's very clear that there's a trafficking motif that's cryptic and we have not really s sorted this out uh, completely, but suffice it to say that if you alter this region, particularly if you alter the hydrophobicity of tryptophan 555, um, it basically is fatal uh, to, to the T cell or NK cell. What happens is that export from the endoplasmic reticul reticulum is halted, and that's an environment where perforin actually becomes active, and it actually kills the cell by lysing it, if you like, from the inside. Now, how do these proteins work? Well, um, I thought the first thing to say about this actually uh, is that is the, is the structure was extremely surprising because no one suspected that the structure of perforin would actually be extremely similar to another family of, uh, of actually of bacterial toxins secreted by gram positive organs, so things like pneumolysin, streptolysin, profingolysin, and so forth, uh, that actually share a common <laughs> fold and, and indeed a common. Uh, common mechanism pretty much, except for membrane binding. If it's cholesterol dependent, that this domain down here is important uh, for binding uh, to cholesterol. Uh, in perforin, it's a, C2, it's a C2 domain that's quite different. Nonetheless, what basically happens here is, is that uh, following, if this was perforin, this would be the C2 domain. Calcium binds down here. Once the molecule binds to the target cell membrane, 
the rest of the molecule, and particularly the, in particular the MACPF domain, undergoes a quite remarkable change of structure, of folding. And the key thing is that this uh, four-stranded beta sheet, which um, in the inactive form is, is constrained to this 90-degree angle, uh, extends out. And then there are two groups of helices here, alpha helices called transmembrane helices 1 and 2, become exposed to solvent and then they undergo quite a remarkable change in their configuration and they become beta hairpins and they plunge down into the target cell membrane and then that's, that's a monomer and of course you have lots of them all lined up and that forms, that punches out a pore. Now interesting thing is that um, so, so the, the mammalian perforin and the bacterial, these bacterial toxins actually share a common ancestor going back more than a billion years. So this is one where we've actually got it over the bacteria. We pinch this one from them. It's often the virus is doing it the other way around. But in this case, uh, we seem to have got the upper hand. i have also done cryo-electron microscopy of the entire pore in collaboration with Helen Sable's group uh, in London. Uh, uh, you can tell clearly I'm not a structural biologist, but basically uh, what we see here uh, is, uh, is a 24-fold symmetry in the entire pore, so 24 monomers making this up. The internal diameter across here is about 180 angstroms, which is uh, easily sufficient to admit granzyme B, which is quite small. And then um, uh, uh, about 120 angstroms, or 12 nanometers of the pore, actually juts up above the surface of the membrane. And we can actually, we've actually um, independently confirmed that using atomic force microscopy across these nice uh, donut-shaped le uh, lesions. Uh, and this has been done with uh, Bart Hoog and Boom, also in London at UCL. Now, um, so there's um, fancy ways you can actually prove the mechanism, and one way to do that is to uh, make mutants that are disulfide-locked uh, so, and effectively tether uh, these transmembrane helices and prevent them from unfurling. So the way this works is that you introduce two new cysteine residues, one into the backbone and one into uh, TMH1, and effectively, this prevents this conform conformational change. But the nice thing is that you can actually, if you get this uh, geometry right or, or the, or the, the uh, spacing right, then you can restore activity uh, by adding a reducing agent uh, like uh, DTT. So I'll show you what that looks like. And um, so when I turn this on, you will see that we're looking down from above onto a lipid membrane. And after about a minute, about now, DTT is added. And then very rapidly after that, this is recombinant perforin, and we see the formation of these really lovely, round, very, very uniform donut-shaped lesions. Here's a little, little lipid plug that's going to be ejected. Uh, and over the next few minutes, more and more of these form. In fact, they start to actually coalesce with one another. And very rapidly, the whole membrane, uh, after a few minutes, starts to fall apart. OK. So now. Uh, the, the question of um, transmembrane diffusion or of disruption of endosomes, just, just a, a couple of things on that. Uh, and you may have seen some of these slides before, because I'm sure you know, Misty has probably um, uh, talked a bit about this, but uh, just briefly to make a couple of points. So, uh, so we're, you know, we're uh, pretty clearly of the, of the view that, that transmembrane diffusion is the way these uh, that perforin uh, works and admits granzyme B. So what, we, what I'm going to show you in a moment when I turn this little movie on over here is an AT1 cytotoxic T cell killing a synfecal labelled uh, target and, uh, and basically watch uh, for the hero of the, uh, of the act, uh, which is uh, this little green cell here. It's going to land down here and, and kill this target cell. And there, there's, uh, there, it's labelled, there's some labelling in here. So the T cell itself has been labelled with a calcium sensitive dye. That's quite important. So we can see uh, the generation of that calcium signal. And then, most importantly, uh, in the medium here is propidium iodide. Uh, but um, Jamie Lopez, who, who actually had this idea, uh, decided uh, that rather than using the standard protocol, which goes back to the 60s, where you add about a micromolar of propidium iodide, uh, he decided to add uh, a lot more. And, and what actually happens is that uh, when killing takes place, you can actually see this propidium uh, go straight across that, uh, that membrane uh, and, uh, and, and start to bind to cytoplasmic nucleic acid, so, so basically RNA. And so uh, we believe this is a pretty good evidence uh, of, uh, of, direct, of direct diffusion across the membrane because we, can, we think we can, we can actually effectively see it happening. Now, I had, oops, wrong one. Okay. So down comes the killer cell. 
it'll attach, form a synapse, and around about eight minutes, bang, you can actually see that, what we call that the PI blush, is effectively the PI rushes into the cell, and then very, very rapidly after that, uh, the target cell, cell undergoes uh, apoptotic death. We don't see any of it evidence of formation of gigantosomes or, or endosomes or anything else, and we have looked for markers and so forth, but we can't be convinced. That was with the mouse cytotoxic T cell, CDA positive. The same thing happens with NK cells. He's, he crosses this, this mechanism uh, goes across species as well. Uh, so no movies here, just a number of stills. So here we have an NK cell. At 30 seconds here, it's formed uh, a, a stable uh, synapse with the target cell. You can see that, um, that the green fluorescence is much greater than back here at the start. And from 30 seconds to 110 seconds, so about 70 or 80 seconds, what is sufficient for calcium signaling to take place, for the granules to move to the synapse, exocytosis to occur, perfin to be released, and to form pores in the target cell membrane. So this is an incredibly efficient process, and you can just see there at the point of the synapse uh, the first stage of this PI blush. And uh, the nice thing about this, and this is uh, work that was done again by Jamie and, and, and then uh, Misty Jenkins later when she, got, she joined the group, um, this is nice methodology because uh, we can actually uh, track the relationship between calcium signaling in the killer cell and then the uptake of PI. So we can get a very, very clear definition of the kinetics of this uh, form of cell death. And typically, uh, one or two calcium fluxes are sufficient to give you target cell death. Now, once the granzyme gets in, uh, it kills very, very uh, efficiently. So death here, uh, the lethal hit's delivered within a couple of minutes, basically. Um, and, and that's just shown here um, in this bar chart. So you can see here, these are target cells. Uh, I think they might have been HeLa cells. I don't quite remember. But basically, uh, if you expose them to granzyme alone or perfin alone, uh, the cells remain viable. If you, uh, if you add both together, all the cells die. Uh, and this readout was, I think, at 20 minutes. Uh, and then if you do a time course and, and basically put the same amount of perfin and granzyme in together, but then block the activity of the granzyme B by chasing it in with a specific granzyme B inhibitor, you can see that basically uh, you can sort of partially prevent cell death uh, by, uh, say, two minutes, but by three minutes the death is essentially irreversible. And this is a good inhibitor, it diffuses into cells, and it's, uh, as I say, it's irreversible. And that's accompanied by a very, very rapid cleavage of, of BID. Uh, just in passing, I'll come back to this later, you'll, you'll see you get two forms of BID appearing. There are actually uh, two cleavage sites in BID, and, and granzyme B uh, utilises a specific one, and it's a little bit to the, uh, uh, to the carboxyl end of the one used by caspases. So the first um, band you actually get here is the, shorter, is the shorter form, and then later on you get caspase activation, and then the longer form also turns up, because uh, in this cell line, in fact, you know, BID is incredibly uh, abundant. Now, is perforin important? Yes, it's very important. If you don't have any perforin um, and you're a mouse or a human, uh, it's usually fatal. Now, this was uh, stuff we published uh, many, many years ago. Uh, so the first perforin knockout mouse was certainly not made by us. That was made by David Kagi and uh, Hans Hengartner and colleagues uh, back in the, in the uh, mid-90s. Uh, but basically what these mice show um, is that, they're, 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 first of all, they're markedly immunosuppressed. Uh, they're, they're, as you would expect, susceptible to many types of viruses and intracellular bacteria. They have very little circulating NK cell activity. And in general, if you transplant tumor xenografts into them, those grafts grow uh, more rapidly and they metastasize more readily. One contribution we did make uh, with my colleague Mark Smith was that if you simply allow these animals to age in the animal house, about two-thirds of them over a period of time uh, develop uh, this very aggressive form uh, of B-cell lymphoma, which to us suggests uh, a fatal breakdown of uh, tumour immune surveillance. Okay, so the first description of perforin deficiency in, in humans actually came after that. It was about five years later uh, with a terrific paper in science by uh, Stepatel, and what they showed was that around 50% of paediatric patients uh, with a rare autosomal recessive disorder called familial haemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, or FHL, um, uh, had, had a biallelic mutations of perforin. We now know uh, over the ensuing years there are, there are at least uh, five different subtypes of FHL uh, and, in, and, and the, they're all, they all affect the same pathway. They all effectively uh, re represent either mutations of perforin itself or 
uh, they, they, are, they affect genes that control granule trafficking, uh, granule um, fusion, uh, or exocytosis and release. And, and the principal ones are among 13, syntaxin 11 and MUNK18 too. And there are, then there are also some, no, a number of other rarer syndromes that aren't restricted to the immune system but often affect uh, other tissue types, like Chediac Higashi, which has a renal defect uh, and so on. These ones tend to have a more variable presentation and can present later in childhood and adolescence. Now, uh, these unfortunate children um, that are, if, you're, if they're null, completely null for perforin, uh, then the clinical presentation is severe immune dysregulation very, very early in life, um, often quite a lot earlier than six months actually, can happen within days of, of birth. It doesn't actually require a, a, an infection. It's just, the, it's just the load of antigen uh, that just seems to be sufficient to trigger this. Um, the, the commonest presentation is a triad of uh, unexplained persistent fever, enlargement of the liver and spleen, and marked pancytopenia. And the reason they get the pancytopenia is that their myeloid compartment is incredibly activated. And, and, and myeloid cells, macrophages in the bone marrow, <coughs> gobble up basically all the red cell and white cell precursors. And, and these children are, um, are very prone to infection and they also, they're also anemi anemic. Now, they die of, ma of a macrophage hyperactivation syndrome, which is interesting given that perforin's expressed in lymphocytes, but we'll come back to that in a moment. And if you completely perforin null, um, the only hope of a cure is an allogeneic uh, bone marrow transplant. Now, um, one thing we've learned in the last five or ten years, in fact, is that, um, is that uh, perforin status is not an all or none event. So if, you've got, if you inherit two wild type alleles, uh, normally you can expect to be healthy uh, and disease free from this viewpoint. Uh, but uh, and, and if you have none, then you get an early onset FHL, as I just uh, showed you. But in fact, um, what we're finding, in, in humans in, at least, is that, there are, that perforin is actually quite polymorphic. Uh, and there's one very common polymorphism, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. So the actual amount of perforin activity uh, that an individual might have can vary significantly um, from 100% uh, down to close to zero. And there are three common ways uh, this group of patients uh, present. One is late onset or atyp atypical presentations and manifestations of, of FHL, which may not be fatal and can be treated. Quite a few of the patients actually present with cancer, although exactly how many of them do, it's usually a hematological malignancy, and how many of them uh, fall into this basket, we're not completely sure. But the other one that we're um, more and more appreciating is unexplained systemic inflammation, particularly in children and, and adolescents. So, so the, 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 the clinical um, implication of that is actually quite important. I'll come back to that in a moment. So here, uh, a few years ago now, we published um, uh, this table in PNAS uh, of cancer-associated hypomorphic perforin mutations. And the, amazing, the major reason I'm showing is that you can see that in each case, each of these patients had biallelic uh, missense mutations uh, or uh, occasionally a missense mutation with a truncation, but they all had some perforin activity they all developed uh, leukaemia or lymphoma of various types. There's certainly not one dominant disease here. There are all sorts of diseases that occurred. But you'll see here that there's a huge overrepresentation of this A91V allele, uh, which uh, was surprising. Most of these other alleles are really very rare. So um, it had been known for some time that this uh, A91V allele uh, in humans, it's in the mouse it's A90V, uh, is, is common, uh, in, in, in particularly in Caucasians. So 8% of heads, oh, sorry, 8% of Caucasians are heterozygous for this, uh, for this uh, particular allele. So within this auditorium, there'd be uh, a number of people who would presumably have, uh, have, this, uh, have this variant. And it was so common that it was really just considered uh, almost uh, de rigueur to be, uh, to be a neutral polymorphism. But it's not, and in fact, it's quite severely hypermorphic, and it's been shown by us and by another group as well. So in fact, if you uh, express uh, A91V in a variety of forms, uh, either in, say, in baclovirus, where you purify the protein, or, in other, uh, or within a cellular context, it's just definitely very abnormal. So uh, that's shown most um, notably with baclovirus expressed purified perforin, where the mutant has probably only 5 or 10% of wild type function. But that's probably pushing it a bit in terms of physiological context. If you actually uh, overexpress um, A91V uh, in a variety of cell types, but we now express it routinely in, in, the, in the T cells of perforin-deficient mice, 
compared to wild type, if you do, if you carefully match for protein levels and so forth, there's always a, a very significant deficiency with A91V. And we now know why. It's basically the protein is misfolded. And, and most of these missense mutations involve uh, misfolding and instability of the protein, and it's uh, not very effective, and it tends to be, get degraded. A91V also has a mild dominant negative effect over wild type. So if you're a HET uh, with, with A91V, uh, and they're expressed uh, equally, uh, you can actually have less than 50% of activity. So uh, really just the last sort of clinical type uh, slide here is that um, you know, for the last eight or 10 years, we've been very, very happy uh, on occasions where clinicians have problems with uh, undiagnosed cases of systemic inflammation uh, with or without hemophagocytosis. Uh, and, and often it's the hemophagocytosis the pathologist picks up. Uh, and we've been very happy to do the sequencing for, for perforin and, and, and more recently some of these other alleles. And you can see at this stage, I think in the series we had 46 and we sort of published a little paper. Uh, uh, you know, we actually pick up a lot of mutations, a lot, a lot of mutations. Uh, both in perforin, which have been uh, biallelic on many occasions, uh, in, in, or in any of these other genes that, uh, that are involved in the delivery of, of perforin. And I just wanted to highlight uh, two cases that actually were at uh, the Children's Hospital with our uh, colleague Sharon Chu. Uh, and and these, this, in, in both these situations, uh, these are two little girls, one of who turned out to have biallelic perforin mutations, the other one homozygous mutations in MUG13, uh, presented with effectively with steroid refract refractory uh, inflammation of the lung, so interstitial pneumonitis. So we put on steroids that get better, that, that relapse, and so forth. And then eventually, hemophagocytosis was noted, and and the definitive diagnosis was made. So um, so these weren't completely null mutations. The point is, if you're in that mid group, then these sorts of manifestations are possible. Okay, might just grab a bit of water. Okay, so now just going to very briefly recap on, uh, on some of the work that Misty, I'm sure, would have shown you. So very, very briefly, and then uh, extend it a little bit. Gosh, what did I do? Wipe my mouth. Okay, so, so as I say, perfins expressed only in lymphocytes. So, uh, so why does the failure of cell death lead to cytokine hypersecretion by myeloid cells? Well, uh, this really is, uh, is a, a project that... Um, that we um, started off actually looking at, 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 at something a little bit different. So, um, so um, one of the properties of, of, of CTLs and NK cells, of course, is that they, they're serial killers. And it may well be. This is one of Misty's movies, I'm pretty sure. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, if you look at uh, this, this fellow down here, you can see him going through and killing, happily killing many cells in the field. Uh, you can actually, there actually is, um, you can actually see the PI blush with these. You see that one from time to time. But the point of showing this is that these uh, killers are very, very efficient. So in about 80 minutes, this guy killed, I think, eight target cells. So some sort of deserves a gold medal, I think. Uh, okay. But the point is that if that for that to occur, uh, the cell has to not only kill, but it has to detach from the first target and move on to another one. And uh, I'll guarantee if you get on PubMed and you look at um, all the papers on T-cell adhesion, there are thousands. And if you look at T-cell detachment, there's not one, except probably the one that Misty and I published last year. So it's an area that just hasn't been looked at. It's been assumed to be completely uh, passive. Uh, and it's uh, not as completely down to the mechanism I'm going to show you, but the mechanism we've identified, uh, I think, at least uh, plays some role. So when I turn this movie on now, instead of seeing that guy gallivanting around killing, um, so what you see here now is a perforin deficient OT1 uh, uh, CDA positive mouse T cell and it's trying very, very hard to kill this target cell. This is now in hours and it's basically stuck and, um, and it's not going anywhere. So um, Misty and her colleagues uh, did a fantastic job um, actually looking at the kinetics of cell death uh, and, and the time it took from that first calcium flush flux in the killer cell until detachment uh, took place. And eventually they did actually part ways, I think, but it was after uh, two and a half hours. So um, we look at wild type, the killing's all over and detachment takes place in this system, in this model, uh, in about eight minutes. And you can see that that's, uh, that's a pretty tight uh, statistical finding. With perfect deficiency, it's about 40 minutes, so it takes on average about uh, five times as long, although there's clearly a, a wide range. Now, it was not just the deficiency of perforin, because if you use um, OT1s, 
that have perforin but lack both granzymes A and B, you get uh, almost exactly the same uh, phenotype. Uh, so what this suggested to us was that it wasn't um, either the presence of these granzyme proteases, because actually granzymes, amongst the many things that have been reported to do, do cleave, do cleave integrins. So that would have been a mechanism that would have been appropriate. Uh, so, um, but either way, if you don't get target cell death, then the cells just don't seem to separate very well. So that raised another question. So if it's cell death that's important, what's the signal for detachment? Does it arise in the killer cell that says, it's about time I went off and killed another cell, um, time to move on, or is there something generated by the, by the dying target cell? So to try and address that possibility, uh, Misty and colleagues went back to these wild type OT1s and now just pre-treated uh, the target cell uh, with, with a caspase inhibitor. And in fact, this again, FINA copied uh, what happens over here. So, and these are completely competent um, wild-type uh, killer cells. Now, QVD is not particularly physiological, but in fact, if you overexpress more physiologically relevant inhibitors like BCL2 and XIAP, uh, again, you get exactly the same thing. Um, so, um, so there, there appears to be a very strong correlation between the capacity of the target cell to die and the, um, the kinetics or the time it takes for the T cell to realise that that's happened, if you like, and then to, to move on and kill something else. Now, um, a key finding uh, from those very supernatants that I've just been showing you, so if you, if you do these, uh, these supernatants and, and do cytotoxicity assays for four hours, if you then collect the supernatant and look at what's in there in terms of cytokine secretion, it's actually very surprising. So, so over here, control, that doesn't mean there's no death. That's where you do get cell death in the wild type situation. All right? And you get a certain amount of interferon, gamma, TNF and so forth secreted. You get that much. However, if the, target, if the, if the killer cell, this is an NK assay, but it works for CTL as well, if it lacks perforin or it lacks granzymes A and B or it's wild type but caspases are blocked, you get strikingly more... Uh, interfere on gamma secretion. And it's not just interfere on gamma, it's TNF, it's a whole lot of chemokines and so forth. So this is, uh, I emphasise, this is fold change. It isn't percentage change or, or, uh, or something like that. You get a stack of, of cytokine released. And, um, and actually one of the things I've neglected to mention, so maybe just nick back quickly. So it's exemplified very nicely here. Uh, so this is the perfect knockout killer cell, so there's no perforin, so you don't see a PI blush, that makes sense. But the other thing you see here over this time where the cells are in contact is you get repetitive, this sawtooth sort of pattern of continual calcium fluxing in the killer cell, right? So it is, it, it is being hyper-stimulated uh, and that, we believe, is part of the mechanism that ultimately results in uh, cytokine hypersecretion. Now, what about the myeloid part? Well, uh, if we take those supernatants and then expose them to naive macrophages, um, then we get nice secretion by the macrophages of IL-6. That's an important pro-inflammatory cytokine in FHL. And most of this effect is mediated by interferon gamma because if the, if the macrophages uh, on the receiving end are deficient in interferon gamma receptor, then you lose most of the IL-6 response. And then I won't show you all the negative data, but, but Misty and her colleagues executed uh, a number of other possibilities. So, to summarise, um, so what happens in a healthy situation is that the killer cell, and this works for CTL, NK, human or mouse, all four combinations. Uh, if killing occurs uh, and the target cell dies, the target cell, we believe, must generate some caspase-dependent signal, which is then generated back to the, to the killer cell. Uh, that acts as a signal for detachment. The killer cell goes on and does serial killing, Calcium signaling is switched off, at least until another target is engaged, and cytokine secretion is normal. In, a, in an abnormal situation, um, where the target cell is the target cell that's either blocked because caspases don't work over here, or because the killing is inefficient, then it's exactly the opposite. So detach, the detachment is markedly delayed. Obviously, uh, you won't get as much serial killing. Calcium signaling does, is not properly switched off. And then you get cytokine hypersecretion leading to a macrophage activation and uh, an FHL. And I should, ask, I should um, 
mentioned that the actual molecular basis or cellular basis for the detachment itself we still haven't got uh, to the bottom of. Um, and um, you know, we'd, that's, that's one thing we'd, you know, if people are interested perhaps in collaborating on that one, that could be something we could discuss. All right, now, um, it's all very well. I work in a cancer centre. Uh, FHL syndromes are, on the whole are pretty rare. But of course, um, let's assume that the, the, that the, um, that the subject, be they human or mouse, uh, is wild type for all of these effector molecules. But of course, we know very well the blocks to apoptosis are very, very common in cancer cells. It's one of the hallmarks of cancer. Uh, and, and of course, in many, in many virus infections as well. So, so this just by itself has the potential to alter intratumoral inflammation uh, in the event of, of, of immune attack. And so one of the things we're moving to do, and again, I'll just show you really the first couple of ex uh, proof of concept experiments, is to try and define this uh, a bit more, um, a bit more um, a bit more thoroughly. So in this proof of concept experiment, um, and, and I should say this is uh, an ongoing collaboration with Misty and also uh, Amy Rogers, um, is that, is that um, we took this mouse and uh, either wild type or perforin null, syngenetic background, and injected them with a cell line called uh, MC38, which is an adenocarcinoma line, uh, let these um, tumours grow, and then simply harvested uh, uh, the tumour. Uh, we also harvested the spleen, but I'm not going to show you that today, and looked at the cytokine profile in the tumour and the type of tumour infiltrate. Now, this is a little bit of a, um, you know, one can uh, criticise this experiment in a variety of ways, but basically the way we did it was as follows. So MC38 uh, targeted by syngenetic NK cells in a perfin-dependent de uh, manner. You can see the perfin knockout NK. You get essentially no killing over the four-hour assay. Uh, and, and if you grow, if you grow them uh, in vivo, uh, the control of, uh, by wild type is perfin dependent as well, uh, although the tumour is uh, rarely uh, totally rejected. So what we did, we didn't want to look out here obviously, but we came back as close as we could back here to the start uh, where there were palpable tumours that we could harvest, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, as early on as possible, where effectively between up to about seven days these tumours are effectively look, look much the same and they're the, they're the same size. And, and essentially what we found is that we could effectively replicate uh, what we got in vitro. So as I say, um, this, um, this doesn't um, uh, prove the case at all, but it's just a proof of concept experiment. But again, um, very, very large amounts of interferon gamma, many of these other cytokines uh, and chemokines. When we looked at the cellular infiltrate, um, again, uh, so what we got was infiltration not only with monocytes and macrophages, but with um, uh, many of the other uh, myeloid cells, neutrophils and eosinophils. Um, there were um, more NK cells as well. There were actually fewer CD8 T cells, which is interesting, but both the NK cells and, and, and the perforin deficient uh, T cells that did get into the tumour were absolutely loaded uh, with interferon gamma. So that gives us some um, encouragement uh, to do, I think, the real experiment, which would be now to use wild-type mice and compare uh, these cells or other targets that are either uh, wild-type or engineered to have multiple blocks in apoptotic pathways. I think that would be another more interesting proof-of-concept experiment, and we're just undertaking or getting ready to go into those ex experiments now. Now... Um, in the remaining time, and uh, I'll, I'll, I don't want to go over time, but I've got a couple of, in, I hope, in stories that you might find interesting. I just want to cover a couple of things on granzymes um, because this is a really messed up field. Um, you know, there's an in incredible amount of contradictory literature. Everyone does things differently. No one agrees on anything. Everyone fights. Um, that happens in perforin as well. Uh, but um, for, we've, we've been the stayers in the perforin field, so there isn't that much competition left. So one of the advantages of getting, getting old, but hopefully staying reasonably healthy. Okay, so a little bit of background, first of all. Um, so, so mice and humans are, and rats and others uh, are different with respect to granzyme. So humans have five. Um, I've mentioned granzyme B. It cleaves after aspartate. It's on, the gene's on chromosome 14. The other principal one is granzyme A, which is very abundant, and so is granzyme B. And it's got a trypsin-like specificity. Right, so it's a processing enzyme as well. It doesn't digest, just digest any old thing. Uh, and so on a different chromosome. And, in, and then there are chymases or chymotrypsin-like enzymes, and they're different in each species. And in human, there's one, and it's called granzyme H. 
Now, um, the starting point for the next bit is, is another little film, but here I, I just want to be at pains to show you. So there's green and red in this, but it's different. So for a start, the green um, is not calcium flux. It's, it's more conventional annexin staining, so looking at uh, phosphatidylserine exposure. And then the red is, again, propidium iodide, but this is the standard way of doing the experiment, so you won't see a PI blush here. What you'll see at the end is PI uptake and staining of the cells when the cell undergoes secondary necrosis. So, um, so if we turn this on, so the times I'll show you are quite different to what we saw before because it tends to greatly under, uh, overestimate the time. So it's very, very quick, but basically nanomolic concentrations of perforin and recombinant granzyme B, um, by the time I got back it, it was all over, uh, that, that basically what happens is the cell undergoes, you can see classic apopot apoptotic morphology, and nexin uh, 5 gets exteriorised and then PI uptake occurs. All right, so that's, if you like, the, the base case. That's what happens with, uh, with, with granzyme B. Now, say, the literature's a mess. Many, just about every granzyme's been shown to kill cells, but there are many contradictions in the field, and the field's actually littered with all sorts of, in my opinion, uh, not very well done studies. Why? Well, the biggest uh, sin is to, is to mix substrates, cells, and proteases across species. As I'll show you in a moment, they're actually, um, you know, you can't do that because they're actually different. Uh, second thing is that granzyme polymorphisms exist within a species. Not quite so many in humans, but there are a lot in mice. And then the other thing I think is that if you're going to really make a claim that granzyme X um, is, um, is pro-apoptotic, then it'd be nice to have some biochemical evidence as well as perhaps ideally some genetic evidence. If the two line up, then you've probably uh, got a better chance of being right. Then there are some other things. Um, the antibodies are, are crap, basically. So we make our own, and so here's, a, here's an antibody against human granzyme B and human granzyme H, which are actually structurally quite close. And here's one sold by, I can't remember who, don't buy it because it, it, it's, it actually picks up both. So good luck trying to sort out what's going on because lots and lots of cells, like resting human in K cells, make a stack of granzyme H. So um, don't use that antibody. If you want ours, we're very, very happy to give them to you. A um, couple of other things. Um, this sounds um, uh, remarkable, but um, you have to say the protease needs to be physio physiologically relevant um, and that they need to come together, uh, actually be capable of coming together with the substrate. Now that seems remarkable, but uh, people will publish all sorts of things. So, so, so here's an instance here where we've, we've, we can show that trypsin is strongly pro-apoptotic. And the way you do that is that when you take the cells, that the, your adherent cells off the plastic, you don't wash them that well and you leave a bit of trypsin in the medium. And then when you add the perforin, you get um, nothing much with perforin alone, but if you leave just enough trypsin in, you get beautiful trypsin-mediated cell death. Now, that does not mean trypsin is a pro-apoptotic protease. Now, that's a trivial example but you do see uh, signs that's, uh, that's not particularly good. So, questions. Are all granzymes cytotoxic? Which are most powerful, and is there a hierarchy? So I'm going to have to race. Now, I thought I'd show this paper, Davo, because the very first group, the first paper that came out um, that said, uh, and this is a good news story. We actually, I think the field sorted this one out. It took 20 years. Um, so is granzyme B inhibitable by BCL2? So here's a, here's a paper we published together with David Vo uh, and Vivian Sutton. And it says BCL2 prevents apoptosis by perforated granzyme B, that is recombinant stuff, but not a whole lymphocyte. So the conclusions you can immediately draw from this, if, assuming the paper is correct, is that BCL2 blocks human granzyme B and that there must be other pathways. And so uh, this isn't a figure, it's a figure from another paper doing a clonogenic assay with uh, we high lines, FDCP1 and FDC. Uh, expressing um, wild-type BCL2. And you can see with the various controls here, um, with perfin alone, for example, you get exactly the same number of colonies after treatment. If you treat with the same amount of perforin and an anamolar concentration of granzyme B, the BCL2 expressing cells survive and, the, and, the, and those that don't uh, all die. Now, if you actually look at, the, at, if you actually look at BID, uh, it's very interesting. The BID sequence actually con contains two cleavage sites. It has one that's used exclusively by caspases, and then just downstream there's one that's used uh, exclusively, we think, by granzyme B, and they're about 15 uh, residues apart. So here's, some, uh, here's a couple of figures uh, lifted uh, from Vivian Sutton's paper. We published this in uh, JEM in 2000. So bear with me, I'll be very quick. So these are now tunnel assays. 
and looking at DNA fragmentation, therefore, and you can see up here, a variety of controls, perfin alone, no cell death, perfin and granzyme B, uh, you get cell death, tunnel positive cells. If you overexpress BCL2, you don't. Now, if you, you can actually override the BCL2 uh, block by overexpressing BID as well. So what this shows is that if you overexpress BID in, in addition to BCL2, you can restore cell death. If you, if you instead of using wild type BID, you use BID in which the caspase site is, uh, is engineered out, is, is, is removed effectively, uh, you, 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 um, uh, you still get cell death. Uh, however, uh, uh, you still override the BCL2 block, I'm sorry. Uh, however, if you leave this caspase site intact uh, and, and use BID where the granzyme B site is, um, is engineered to, uh, to be absent, uh, then you're unable to, to overcome. So this suggests that human granzyme B only, uh, or certainly preferentially cleaves after D75. Now here's, here's really the key slide. Uh, and again, this is actually work done um, in collaboration with us, but mainly out of Phil Bird's lab at Monash. And really, you know, you need to do these things properly and do things like kinetics to actually and look at, you know, substrate to uh, enzyme ratios and so on. So again, if you're doing an assay uh, with any granzyme B and you want to measure the activity, my strong, my strong recommendation is you buy this substrate. It's the vanilla substrate, ala ala asp, with an indicator group on the end. Uh, all granzymes B will cleave that and cleave it with roughly equal kinetics. There's about a two-fold difference here. However, if you look at a substrate based on the bid sequence, you can see immediately that there's a huge difference between these are recombinant um, human uh, granzyme B and recombinant mouse granzyme B. There's a 30 or 40 fold difference here. If we actually look at, <clears throat> at protein lysates now, uh, but whoops, both human and, human and mouse cleave mouse caspase 3 roughly equivalently, but if you look at bid as a substrate, then it's very, very different. So the human cleaves recombinant bid beautifully, you can see, and mouse is pretty lousy at it. Okay, and then biologically, down, what you see down here uh, is a very careful titration of the amount of granzymes used, uh, dictated by the amount of activity, which is really ought to be the key. And so what this shows is that the human granzyme B kills bid competent cells far more efficiently over here. So that's, um, that's, that's a bid competent cell with human granzyme B than bid negative cells. There's about three logs of activity difference here whereas mouse granzyme B actually doesn't care very much uh, either way. So, so, what, so the species difference is summarised broadly speaking here. So human granzyme B preferentially cleaves BID. It, BID then goes on to activate MOMP or to cause MOMP, and that's, so BCL2 can get in the way there. And then things like you know, caspase activation, not showing caspase 9 here, but it goes through caspase 9 and the cell dies. Mouse BID's different. It uh, doesn't cleave BID hardly at all. It cleaves to caspases directly, and then uh, any bit cleavage is secondary to caspase activation, uh, but, but death is consequence on caspase activation. <coughs> now, three groups actually agreed on that, so I've put them all up, um, and that was great. And one of the other things that was very interesting that came out of these studies, and this is a, 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 a very interesting um, piece of data from uh, the, the group at Johns Hopkins, was that they did the phase display and actually looked at the optimal amino acid preferences in the various positions at the, at the granzyme cleavage site. So you can see for three of them, at P4, P3 and P1, I, E and D, um, they're, they're basically the same. But at P2, they're very, very different. Not only are they different, they're effectively mutually exclusive. Because what this shows is that the human will cleave very, very nicely if you have uh, proline, serine or threonine, but if you have phenylalanine, uh, it, don't, it that doesn't work. And the mouse is exactly the opposite, okay? So this isn't a matter of choice. They're actually quite, quite different, which, which sort of surprises. So um, this sort of left us um, a bit curious. Um, and so we thought, well, this is a bit odd. So in, in mouse bid, the cleavage side's P and not F. So I guess that explains the lack of cleavage. So that's sort of fair enough. But were there any other explanations? So one thing we'd noticed, and I'm not going to show you the data, is that rat looks like human, which seemed odd. Uh, given the evolutionary time in between. And in fact, rat granzyme B is inhibited by BCL2. So it was a bit of a wild idea, but we thought, well, maybe there are other alleles of mouse granzyme B. And so Kevin Thea, uh, who's a um, uh, fantastic research assistant, actually looked at this and we, we, we actually, actually typed 13 inbred strains and a whole lot of wild mice captured all over Australia. And we, we had a second uh, cohort um, from JAX just to, and they sent us DNA. 
from these wild mice. And lo and it was this blow us down. It was amazing. So in the, in the 13 inbred strains, which are all derived from Mus musculus domesticus, all 13 had essentially the same allele. There was one tiny irrelevant difference here, all the same. They all came, of course, there's a founder effect here. But when you looked at all the outbred mice, there were, I don't know how many alleles. In 90 mice, we found about 20 alleles. And some f flavors of granzyme B had as many as 18 amino, acid, amino acids different. Now, if this is granzyme B, and if, I'll tell you why later uh, rather than take up time. But um, some of these, some of these um, variations actually were predicted to affect the substrate cleft, and I won't go into that at the moment to save, save time. And the mod modelling predicted uh, that, that some of them might be more human-like. So we expressed them and saw what happened, and, 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 and we called this allele W, uh, the, most, um, the one that's furthest away from the inbred. And it actually behaves not exactly like human, but it's a lot more like human. So now we can see that this allele cleaves bit very nicely, um, the, whereas the uh, inbred um, uh, variety does not, uh, it's actually far less efficient at cleaving these two caspases. Right. And yet, um, if you just add them to generic cells with perforin, they both, they both kill quite nicely. So, so there's no intrinsic problem here. Right. But so we thought, well, you know, I mean, this, this might seem going a bit too far, but we decided to make a congenic line. And we back-crossed. We didn't do a knock-in for various technical reasons, but we back-crossed and we made sure we didn't include any other poly, uh, polymorphisms when we did the back-cross. Um, and then we... So we effectively had a black six mouse that had this W allele. And then we challenged uh, those mice, or Maria Peer in Perth did, uh, uh, and, and Arno Mulbacher in those days up in Queensland, challenged them with ectromelia uh, or with MCMV. And we picked those two because they're two, they're two natural mouse pathogens. OK, they're real. Real mice don't like these real pathogens. And, um, and, and in fact, granzyme B status makes a difference. So if you're AB deficient uh, with ectromelia, it, it's uh, a massive problem. They're, they're incredibly important for pox viruses. And also uh, uh, with this, um, with this um, strain, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Sorry, I'll just reboot. Yeah, okay. So I haven't got that. So it must be there. Get your pointer across the other screen. Yeah, I'll just hold on. Just get rid of it. I'll scroll it right across. Where is it? Sorry. Can you just scroll it? No, oh. oh, I see. Oh, great. Sorry about this. I know I'm a bit late on time, so. It's a shame I was within the last 50 slides, too. <laughs> I've got it up here, but it's not coming up on the screen, I'm afraid, so sorry. Okay, okay so very quickly, and I apologise, I'm going to be a little late. Okay, so, so, um, so what, we, what we actually did was that, um, was that um, Maria Peer and, and Chris Andonio actually infected these mice, and, and really the, the result was, was very, very surprising. So... So the, 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 the black six strain all survived and, and, the, and the back cross basically all died. And uh, we've tried very, very, very hard uh, to look for a, a trivial explanation for this, but we don't think actually that there is one. So um, the reason that the mice died is that there was unrestrained viral replication in the liver. In particular, they died of, uh, of liver failure. You can see the marked increase in transaminase levels. Um, there's a lot more viral replication, as uh, done, shown by this um, immunohistochemistry with viral antigen. And uh, I won't go into detail, but the pathologist said there was lots and lots of necrosis here and lots and lots of cytopathic inclusion. So there's a num lots and lots of things we excluded, but basically this is the, this is the punchline. So we obviously looked at, the, at whether these mice were able to raise specific CD8-positive T cells and get them to deliver? And the answer was yes. And they did that exactly equally. And then if you took, took those cells and asked them to kill EL4 targets that have been pulsed with the appropriate peptide, they were equally able to do that. 
But if you actually got the same cells to try and kill MCMV-infected relevant IC21 macrophages, they don't. So, so there's got to be a reason for that. We still haven't got to that, but basically we have a number of hypotheses. So this, uh, this strain of uh, MCMV is known to encode a number of viral inhibitors, uh, and, and some of these um, uh, operate through the, through the mitochondrial pathway, so they may well be um, having an effect there. Um, and then more broadly, I think, um, uh, so why, why, would this, why would this happen? Well, um, if you actually look at the allele that we selected, I, said, I might have said earlier, but basically it is getting pretty close to another, uh, another subtype of mus musculus called mus musculus castaneus, and Mus musculus castaneus is effectively confined in this distribution uh, to parts of Asia around China and, uh, and so forth. And it could well be that what we're seeing here is a mismatch between um, the allele that, uh, that, is able to, um, that is normally able to control this particular strain of the virus, which would normally be the black six allele, the inbred allele, uh, and, and the W allele um, is inappropriate because they're actually never, they're never in the same geographic location. Clearly, if they were and this result were right, well, they wouldn't be for very long because the virus would kill all those mice. So this could well be just uh, simply a, a, a manifestation of that. Can I have two minutes? Yeah. All right. Um, now, um, so I've got, only got about five slides left, so, so um, uh, I promise. Really, really, really quickly, what happens when you haven't got granzyme B? So um, there's a lot of stuff about granzyme A killing, and basically we don't agree with most of it. So... Um, so we had a, a, a system here we think we could, we had, could actually have a good go at, at what was happening with granzyme A mediated killing. So here's a killing assay. We've got wild type uh, killers. Uh, these are MC57, mouse adenocarcinoma. If you remove granzyme B, uh, you lose some of the death, but you've got a bit left, a fair bit left. If you then remove A and B, uh, you get down to more. So this bit presumably is due to A, and in fact, you get down to background levels. In fact, the rest of the, the killing isn't perfect dependent. So, um, just to remind you, I'm not going to play the movie again, but, but what I showed you before with Granzyme B is, is that it, Granzyme B is very, very rapidly initiated. The, the morphology is apoptotic and the next it precedes PI. And, and you can see right back here, well before even PI staining occurs in this, uh, then you've got florid apoptotic morphology. Now, if you have Granzyme B deficient NK and you remove that pathway, what you see is completely different. So what you see now is far slower initiation. Um, what Olivia Sasanto, the PhD student who did this work, called wormy death, and I think it's a good, it's a good title. Um, I, I decided to insult all the neurologists by calling it athetosis because it's because the cells writhe, right? It's like chorioathetosis. In any event, we haven't decided on a name, but but you'll notice here that the cell undergoes this remarkable these remarkable changes in shape. And then, in fact, um, an exon and PI occur at the end, at the time of, of, of secondary necrosis. Now, so here's a, here is a cell, a granzyme B deficient cell that actually kills. Uh, so it's here, and there's actually these stills here. And you can see uh, that that cell, does not, it, that doesn't look like apoptosis, all right? Um, it basically, it looks like that. And then at the end, it just, it just bursts. Now, um, so perhaps I'll, I'll leave that one, except to say that Olivia, who's a PhD student, was incredibly diligent and looked at hundreds of these cell, types of cell deaths. So if you have wild type, it's all apoptosis. If you remove granzyme A, it looks pretty much exactly the same. If you remove granzyme B, you get a lot less death and it's all this alternate form of death. And if you remove them both, yet you get nothing. So that looked like genetic evidence of, uh, of grounds I may being in, in important. And rather than running through this, I'll show you the movie of what happens uh, when you actually have, um, instead of grounds on B, mouse grounds on A with perforin and effectively phenocopies. Okay, so it, you, know, you get this funny writhing morphology and then the cells pop at the time of secondary necrosis. And the last um, film, so we believe the granzyme B is dominant here. So what we did here was a little race, and we set them up together at the IC50s and asked which one would kill quicker. And you'll see here um, that, um, that over here on the left, granzyme B uh, is very, very efficient, and this has completely spifflicated the whole lot uh, very rapidly, and it's all apoptotic death. 
and way back here, uh, trying very, very hard, is granzyme A with the same amount of perforin, and, and it's still uh, earlier on. So I think that's uh, a little bit of further evidence that, uh, that, that, the, um, uh, that um, this death is, 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 is subdominant to granzyme B. What's the mechanism? We don't know yet, uh, but it's not dependent on caspases, it's not inhibited by BCL2, all of these other things, you do not see early mitochondrial disruption. The one thing we have found is that it requires an intact actin cytoskeleton. So if you tr pre-treat the target cells with either mycalalide or latrunculin, which disorganise the actin cytoskeleton, you can see it has no effect at all on granzyme B, but it completely gets rid of granzyme A. If we get rid of intact uh, uh, microtubules with taxol or nicotazole or whatever you like, it actually makes no difference. So it's actin dependent. And then there's a hierarchy. And thanks to everyone. I think I've mentioned most people. Certainly, um, a lot of this work uh, is uh, in collaboration with Ilya Voskoboynik that I'd really like to mention, Misty I've mentioned, Viv Sutton, uh, and, and many others. And uh, thank you. For, sorry for going over time, and thanks for your attention. Those who have to go can go, but let's stay and, uh, and ask Joe a couple of questions. And I'll uh, head off with the first one, which is when you were talking about differences between uh, humans and rats, I thought you were going to suggest uh, doing a survey of humans, and I was going to ask uh, Donald Trump, what's your prediction? <laughs> Any serious questions? I hope he doesn't get up. Um, not geographically associated. Um, there are um, two principal alleles. Uh, there are three polymorphic sites, but they're in linkage to equilibrium, and we're starting to look at them um, now. Uh, they're not um, sort of ethnically or geographically uh, related. Interestingly, A91V, the perforin one, is. So that's only found in Caucasians. It's not in African Americans or Asians. So it's, it's, if it's a mutation, it's happened quite recently. Okay. Fascinating talk. Uh, I wondered about the first part. Did I understand that the, what you said, the perforin deficiency can either lead to systemic inflammation or in some cases to diverse types of lymphoma. Can you, do you have a hypothesis that relates those two? So I, I, think, I think, Jerry, that, um, that if you have, um, so if you have, um, uh, no, if you have no perforin activity at all, then very, very rapidly you have this immune dysregulation. Um, if you have a, a, a bit and it's enough to get you by, um, then you are, um, you are open to, um, depending on the immune stimulus, to developing periodic, uh, episodic, um, often steroid responsive system, bouts of systemic inflammation. In fact, all those patients did have that. It was one after the after the other, and it takes years to make the diagnosis. With respect to cancer, of course, it's far more speculative. So the speculation there would be that we are seeing something akin to what we see in the mice, and even that isn't completely explained. But if you're a if you're a believer in the immune surveillance of cancer, um, then uh, then we would postulate that. Uh, pre-malignant cells are popping up from time to time and presumably they're controlled in a perfin-dependent manner. That's the way we would see it being, uh, being related. Having said that, those numbers, of course, that I showed are completely meaningless because we haven't done any sort of a prospective or cohort study and we've got ideas about how you might do that. But suffice it to say, with a, with a hypomorphic allele that, that's, that's that hypomorphic and that frequency, if you do a calculation, um, in the Australian population, there ought to be 40,000 homozygotes for A91V around. So it'd be fascinating to know what happens to those people over time. But of course, it's, you never type for things like perforin, so we don't know. We'd love to go back and actually, one way we thought of doing it was to get Guthrie spot DNA from 1990, type them for perforin, and then sort of trace up and see what happened to the A91 homozygotes and see if they've got cancer or. That'd be great to do that. We can't get it through ethics. So, of statistics. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> ask, ask the hackers. One more question. All right, you're all, you're all free to go. Thank you. Good. Good.